Hi, this is Brendan Kane, the author of Hook Point, How to Stand Out in a Three-Second World. And I would say the best piece of advice that I ever got is that this is a marathon. It is not a sprint because starting out in business, I was so impatient and always wanting things to happen super quick. And oftentimes that would catch me up. So that piece of advice has really helped me over the course of my career. Welcome to the Inside Sales Show hosted by Phil Gerbershack. Each episode will take you behind the scenes with a sales expert or a sales practitioner and go inside the nuances you need to be successful today in sales and sales leadership. We'll have conversations about the mindset, skill set, and tool set of highly successful sales professionals, offer insights into prospecting, qualifying, following up, closing sales for inside sales professionals, and hiring, firing, motivation, and rewarding your team for inside sales leaders. And we will find out what's working and what's not working for inside sales pros right now. And now, here's your host of the Inside Sales Show, sales speaker, sales trainer, and pinball wizard, Phil Gerbershack. Hey, what's up, everyone? So glad you joined us today. We're talking Hook Point, how to stand out in a three-second world with Brennan Kane. Super exciting. His first book was how to get one million followers in 30 days. What the heck? And now he follows it up with this soon-to-be bestseller. Congratulations, Brennan. It's good to be happy here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to connect with you, Phil, and all the listeners out there. Yeah, cool, cool. So, so we got what? Someone says stop. That's interesting. Well, maybe that means hammer time. I don't know. Or maybe we'll collaborate and listen. I don't know what that is. But, Brennan, what the heck is a hook point, man? So, a hook point is really at the highest level to grab attention uh, because we, we live in a three second micro attention world. And the reality of it is we're no longer just competing against our direct competition. We're competing against every piece of content out in the world, whether it's competing with LeBron James or the latest Netflix film or The Rock. Like people are constantly swiping and swiping and swiping. And because there is so much noise in the world today, you've got to find a way to get somebody to stop, to pay attention to what you have to say. So a hook point is a tool that allows you to win the first part of the conversation and allows you to get to the next part. Now, there's three core pillars to making a hook point successful. The first I just described is is grabbing that attention, and we can dive into different tactics of how to do that uh, next. Um, So the first is creating that hook point to grab that attention. The second part is once you have the attention, what is the story that you're going to tell to maintain or retain that attention? Because at the end of the day, we're not talking about clickbait here. Once you have the attention, you have to do something with it. You have to retain that audience. And then the third is, are you doing it credibly? Are you doing it authentically? Is it coming off like people can trust and believe in what you're saying? So all three have to play together in order to be successful because if you can't grab attention, you'll never get to your story. You'll never get to your product or service. You'll never get to your pitch. Uh, if If you grab attention, but your story isn't good, then you lose the attention you just gained. And then third is maybe you grab the tension and have a compelling story, but if people don't believe it, then it falls flat. Wow. That's a great, great philosophy. That's a great model for us to follow. Let's start at the end of that first, because I I think a lot of people miss that. I really think, you know, people that aren't credible often can do the first two, but then the third one whiffs there. And And I see that sadly too often. I've been online a long time and I see that. So what is credibility? actually mean? How do we know that someone's credible and why is that so important, Brennan? Well, if people don't trust or believe you, they're either not going to take the action that you're looking for, or it may have backlash in your brand and they may share to other people that you're not credible and, and not to believe you. But really the best way to determine whether you're being authentic or people are believing and trusting is have a clear KPI that you're measuring your content or your campaign against. And that will help you determine, is it, is it resonating from a credibility standpoint? Now, with that said, is there's different reasons that your KPIs could not fall into place. It could be, again, you're not winning that first part of the conversation. You're not telling the story uh, properly, or people are not believing what you're saying. One tool that you can do is just looking at the comments uh, around your content. Now, with that said, I want to say with a grain of salt, because no matter what you're doing, if you're doing it at scale, you're going to get negative backlash 
from your stuff. It's just, it, it's pretty much unavoidable. I've never seen an instance where there's a hundred percent positivity. So you've just got to determine uh, how much of the negative is coming in versus the positive. You know, is it, is it 50% negative? Is it 5% negative? And then you can make a determination from there. Awesome. That makes sense. So positive and negative, that's good. Also, uh, is depth of, of content or comment, is that important as well? I mean, do, we, do you expect that people are going to leave like a thoughtful comment? They're going to just be like, hey, that was awesome. Something like that. It depends. You know, different people have different levels of time that they can commit to things and thus they'll, they'll spend more or less time. I would say, I would just say, look at the volume of the comments and not necessarily overtly in depth because I've seen some crazy in-depth comments that were just, obviously somebody was not in the psych psychological state of mind to be writing that, or they've gone through something else that day that is obviously impacted. Uh, but another tool that you can look at, and we look at this a lot with analytics is, uh, both organically or paid is to determine whether it's really the authenticity that's killing it is look at the number of three, uh, the views that you generate to reach. So a view today is not counted at the one second mark. It's counted at the three second mark uh, because a while back the, the uh, advertisers were up in arms that they were get char charged at one second, which shows no intent at all because people can scroll past it, not even look at it and get charged for it. So views to reach ratio is a really good indicator to see if your hook is working, to see if you're getting actually people to stop in the feed and even pay attention. Then the second metric when we talk about stories is really the retention. Okay, now you've made it past that three second mark. What does that retention graph look like? How much time do they actually spend with it? Did they spend 10 seconds? Did they spend 30 seconds, two minutes? That will help you if your story is retaining them. And if the hook and the story are retaining people and you're still not hitting your core action, like maybe it's a sale or it's a lead uh, or it's a click, then I would start looking at the comments and the authenticity around it and seeing if that's the part that's falling flat. Okay. Okay. So that makes, that makes a lot of sense there um, as we look at those, right? The ability to look at views to reach and make sure that you have clear campaign numbers to measure against. So Let's flip back to the beginning of that then, grabbing attention, right? If we don't have that, to your point, you, you say in your book, three seconds, but I would, you know, whatever the time is, I think it's just, you know, do you stop the scroll? Do you stop people from, from moving past your message? So how do we do that? How do we develop that hook point? Well, the first tool and a term that we use a lot is pattern interruption is, again, you're scrolling and just imagine the consumer has just watch LeBron James dunking. They watch the latest Netflix trailer. They watch Kevin Hart telling a joke. Now comes your content. How does your content stack up against them? How, how does it interrupt that pattern to get somebody to stop? Now, one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make that prevents people from stopping is that essentially they're saying the same thing in the same way as everybody else and they're not changing it up. So for example, let's say we're launching a meditation app or a meditation retreat. What most people will say is that meditation is the key to success. Meditation is the key to happiness or focus. Now meditation has been around for thousands of years. And if you type in meditation in Google, there's probably billions of results there. So how can we change that, the pattern interruption? Because if I see the medica meditation is key to success or meditation is the key to focus, I've seen that already a thousand times. So I'm just going to scroll past it because I already know what this video is going to say. I know what this ad is going to say. So how do we switch that up? How do we generate that pattern interruption? Now, one tool that we use, uh, and we don't use it all the time, and I, and I suggest when we work with clients, we use it sparingly and we use it when it makes sense to use it, is subverting expectations and flipping everything on its head. So going back to the meditation example, how would we do that? How would we stand out? So if I was designing an ad or an organic piece of content uh, for that headline or that meme card that's at the top of the video, I may use something like meditation is a scam. And then the story I would tell is, hey, have you ever been in a position where you just felt like meditation is a scam? I really feel your pain because I've been there myself. I tried everything in the beginning and meditation just wasn't working for me because I was receiving misinformation from all these sources that just weren't credible and weren't working for me. 
So let me share you with you a few tips that got me, somebody that was so frustrated with meditated, meditation, thought it was a scam, it wouldn't work for me to actually get it to work where I've been meditating for 12 years. Will you click the link below to check out more? So that's like an example of one tool, one way that we can do it. Yeah, that's interesting. That's subverting expectations. I see that a lot in the sales space where people say, you know, cold calling sucks or LinkedIn doesn't work or don't use Instagram to prospect or whatever like that. Definitely interrupting the pattern, but often then they don't deliver on that promise in the story or the story is like really boring and vanilla. So how do we how do we create that compelling, memorable story, Brendan? Well, uh, first off, to your point is like if you've already seen a lot of people <clears throat> using it in your space or using it in a particular way, you're going to want to make sure you, you differentiate yourself from those people. So that that's that's one element. Uh, the second part of your question is one of the the tools uh, in my my friend that was featured in the Hookpoint book, Craig Clemens, who's one of the top copywriters in the world, sold over a billion dollars worth of product. One of the things that he said that really resonated with me, I think is brilliant that plays to that is if you can express a consumer's problem better than they can express it to themselves, that's where you learn, that's where you win a tremendous amount of credibility and can win your the KPI that you're going after. So again, going back to the meditation example is like starting off by by expressing the problems that they faced. No, in, in expressing it in a way that I've been there before, I understand what their feelings are about the subject or what they think about the subject, and then speak to that, and then speak to the solution and how it solves. That is one great way. But again, to your point, is these other people have done it, and either what you're saying is their story broke down, or they can't deliver. Thus, their trust and credibility is deteriorated. So that's you know, one way that I kind of look at it of making sure that once we have that attention, we're doing something with it and expressing somebody's problem or solution better than they could express it to themselves is, is one of those great ways to, to win that. That's, that's why it's so important to figure out who we actually serve in these cases, because if we don't, we don't have any idea what their problem is and how we can solve it and, and what the real core of the problem is. And I think that's, that's super important. But you say three, three seconds, right, in the book. And I'm going to guess you mean it's the three seconds to grab the attention, right, to get the hook first and then to drive that story through. Is that, is that right? Just to make sure. hundred percent. Right? Yeah, hundred percent. Most people where they struggle is that in the first three to five seconds, they'll overwhelm the person. They'll try and express their purpose. They'll try and express their why. They'll try and express their product or service when we're not even there yet. You've got to just get them to stop first to pay attention to the next part. And don't get me wrong, like your purpose, your mission statement, your USP, your product service, it's all valuable. It's extremely valuable, but it doesn't mean anything if you can't get them to stop first. Like it, it just, it doesn't because you'll never win the next part of the conversation. Yeah, for sure. If, no, if they're not listening to you, I was joking, I'm doing sales training or sales coaching. People, you know, the goal, people are doing 87 things. Your goal is to get them to lift their head up and say, what? Is there something there that I should be listening to as opposed to forcing so much through the USP or through the value prop or whatever the heck you want to call it. So absolutely, I, I, I totally, totally agree with that. So what are some other errors, Brennan, other than kind of yakking everything at people at once do you find? Yeah, it's overwhelming. Overwhelming them is one. Telling people the same thing over and over again is is the same. One of the 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 other big mistakes is when people are designing content, they're designing it for themselves and how they perceive the world, how they perceive people's challenges, not putting themselves in the other person's shoes. And we use a, a communication framework in our agency uh, that's used by the likes of you know NASA, Pixar, Audi, Bill Clinton to connect with people on scale. And one of the biggest things that we've recognized is that oftentimes uh, we perceive the world in a specific way and the larger population may perceive the world differently. And it's, it's less about the content and more about the context. How are you contextually wrapping your message so that it speaks to the larger population? So for example, there's a, a big percentage that perceives the world through thoughts and logic. There's another big percentage that sees it through feelings and emotions. Other people see the world through values and opinions. Other people see it through humor and comedy. So when we're looking at 
crafting a message or crafting a hook point or telling a story, we want to make sure that we're hitting all of the ways that people perceive. So if I'm telling a story uh, or creating an ad, I want to make sure that I include some facts and data for the people that see the world through thoughts and logic. I want to express how it's going to make them feel to work with us or to buy our product or service. I also want to express my opinions and my beliefs about this product. And then w intertwining some uh, humor about how awesome and fun and crazy it's going to be to use this product. So really differentiating it because if I just speak through thoughts and logic, then ultimately what it could do is you know, tune out up to 70 or 80% of the population. Uh, so that's another big mistake that we work with our clients a lot on is to make sure that they understand how they're communicating and how they can contextualize their, their message and their story to reach more people. Awesome. That makes so much sense. Well, we got a question here from Michael Gerritsen. He says, I've found that sometimes we develop hook points with too much inside baseball, right? We think we'll grab them. So you mentioned interrupting a pattern, but how do we, how do we refine that, Brendan? How do we get even better at that? to be uh, have an even better hook and make sure that we don't get stuck in the inside baseball of everything. Yeah, so uh, a few things. One, again, thinking about the person that's receiving the message. How much do they know? Ask yourself that. Uh, what terminology do they know? What terminology do they know they don't know? In addition, I always look to make my ad or make my organic content or whatever I'm doing interesting to everybody. So even if it's not like the core customer, how could I contextualize this in a way that would bring in the novice outsider uh, to be like, I want to check this out. This is kind of interesting uh, versus very, you know, what often people get into trouble with is they, they think that the old targeting adage is I'm going to just create a piece of content specific to this person, to this demo and the way that they speak. Now, especially from an organic perspective, that can can run into issues because you'll get limited reach in the algorithms because if it's not playing to a larger audience, people are going to start scrolling past it. Same thing with the ads is that people are scrolling past your ads, not inter interacting with it. Oftentimes uh, that will increase your cost in the auction. Now I'm not saying there's a, not a time and a place for that because sometimes you're just doing a campaign for a very specific person for a very specific audience. And thus you need to be hyper-targeted uh, with that inside baseball knowledge. But majority of times, and in, to the, the listener's question, is I think about how I would make it interesting to somebody that knows nothing about the subject matter and then work backwards. Then you can say, listen, maybe you come up with something great, but then you look at it and be like, yeah, maybe that's a too broad, but then you can narrow in from there. So for example, with my first book, One Million Followers, How I Built a Massive Social Audience in 30 Days, is the book is really about the art of testing and testing at scale to identify what works and what doesn't work. Now, if I went out there and said, you know, the uh, a guide to A-B testing, it's going to fall flat. So I went much larger with 1 million followers, how I built a massive audience in 30 days to bring in that larger audience so that I can have a deeper level conversation and teach them the things that they really need to know. Wow. That's great. That that's so powerful, and 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 that is just a reminder to be interesting to everybody. Not necessarily relevant, but interesting. So at least you can get a comment of "Wow, that's interesting." It might not be relevant to me, and it might not buy, but to get a comment, right, will help spin that up and keep that going. And I, and I another, really like that. And another element to it is just because you reach somebody that may not be your buyer doesn't mean that they can't share it with somebody that is. So, for example, like I did a campaign for. A Mother's Day campaign for a company called Chatbooks. It's one of the top online photo printers in the world. And they wanted me to just go after mothers 45 plus. And I said, let me test and let me see what happens. Because the creative was really good. I want to make sure we maximize the potential of it. So I tested a much broader audience. And what was interesting is it actually resonated more with females 18 to 25. And what was happening is they were sharing and tagging their mothers in the post. So we were actually hitting our core demo in a far more powerful way, in addition to introducing the product to a completely new audience. Wow. Wow. But yeah, by hitting a younger demographic, you get the, the demographic that you desire, the money makers, and you get that referability as well, right? That virality as well. So triple bone. Wow. 
that's that's really really powerful, Brennan. So um, so later in your book, you say you have a chapter about taking everything I have. It's yours for free, which I found really interesting. It's very different than what a lot of people are talking about online. So can you talk more about that, please, and how that helps make your hook points even stronger. Yeah, I oftentimes see that people get scared about revealing too much information or giving away too much uh, information about how they do things or their secrets. When really what we've seen from experience is the more that you give to people, the more trust and credibility you will earn with that audience and the likelihood they are to purchase. Now, does that mean that there's not a subset of the audience out there that will just extract as much information out of you for free through an ad or a download or a blog? and try and do it on their own, yeah. But those people are always gonna do that. I, I don't think that hiding things is really gonna win that customer. Now, for certain businesses, you have proprietary information that you don't wanna release to the public, and I understand that. But for a majority of us, that's kind of the, the, the hypothesis that we've seen work time and time again. So for example, in the Hook Point book and even One Million Followers book, we don't hold anything back. We reveal all of our information. We reveal how we do it. And I can't tell you how many people come to us and ask us to hire to do it for them or to do it with them. Because there's one thing of uh, revealing information about how you're doing things and there's another thing to execute on it. You know, like for hook points, for example, we reveal exactly how to craft them in our book. But we also say like the process is simple, but it's not necessarily easy. Like we've been doing it for 15 years. So what we can do in, you know, with our experience and our data that we've collected around this stuff is, is going to outmatch most of the time somebody that's just diving into a book for the first time. So that's why we offer that service of creating hook points for people if they want it. But at the same time, we don't hold anything back. I'm not, I'm not holding any secrets back of how we do things or anything like that. So that's what I mean by that concept of you know, give away everything for free. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's so funny because as as I'm listening to you and as I've read your book, I'm like, man, this guy really does put everything on the table. But it it's really like it, it's more like cooking than it is like a math problem, and that you have to still put the ingredients together with some art, some love, and experience. Not just hey, it takes a cup of this and a pound of this and an ounce of this. It really does take some of that, which I, I think it's so interesting to just be reminded of that. Because so often we forget, we think, oh, that formula is so simple, but it's how you execute it that's different. So 15 years, Brennan, 15 years, how did you, I guess, realize that this is really your secret sauce? And and is this hook point dead or are you on to the next one or what's going on? So how did I realize that? I don't think I realized it, that that is what I was doing until like two or three years ago. Uh, but I've always had people ask me, because people know me from the 1 million followers book, but social media is such a small percentage of what I do. I do a tremendous, I built technology, I work for movie studios, I helped companies grow from a business development standpoint and closed like huge clients like an MTV, a Vice or a Taylor Swift or a Paramount. And I had to really think about what it was that allowed me to achieve all those things and help my, my own companies and brands succeed, but also my clients. And it really came down to being able to differentiate myself, differentiate my products, differentiate my clients in very saturated and overcrowded markets to win that deal, to win that attention, to get that meeting. Uh, and you know, thinking about it deeper, it just I coined the term hook point to kind of conceptualize what that actually means. And it really means at the core essence, how do you differentiate yourself enough to grab that attention so they'll pay attention to what you have to say. Because I run into people all the time that are absolutely brilliant. Either they have tremendous uh, talent uh, to offer the world or their product or service is absolutely brilliant and can transform the world in a positive way. Yet they don't win the business. They don't, they don't have success and they ultimately fail or they struggle to reach the level of scale that they're looking for. And it all comes down to the way that they position themselves. It's interesting that the smarter somebody is, the more successful somebody is, oftentimes it's harder for them to articulate what they do in a very succinct way that helps them stand out. And the reason is, is because it comes so intuitively to them. They've been doing it for so long. They've been studying it for so long, or they've been building it so long to the earlier question, the inside, and the, the inside baseball language gets so ingrained in the way that they 
construct content or ads or communicate that oftentimes it falls flat. Wow. Wow. That's, that's so true, right? That we get so close to the solution that we've been doing all the time and we think it's easy for us. So therefore it must be easy for everyone. And that's certainly not at all the case. So, so, so Brennan, if, if you were to give folks one piece of your own advice, what would be the advice you'd give them as they want to get started creating their own hook point and getting better attention from those that they wish to serve? So I have a five step framework that I break down in the book. And the first step is study other references. And that's like the first place to start is study the market, study outside your market and start collecting hook points uh, that work and resonate and start dissecting what is it about them that work? How could you take a similar approach for your brand, your product or service? So that is really the first place that I would start in learning this process of how to create them. Awesome. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, Brennan, thank you for your time. And folks, if you want to know more about Brennan Kane and the Hook Point process or this fantastic book, go to hookpoint.com, check it out, get to know more. There's so much more that we could discuss. I mean, the book is super, super in-depth. It does give everything away, but you still got to execute it. Hopefully the book will help you. Brennan, thank you so much for your time today. I know I enjoyed it. Hopefully everyone listening did as well. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. You've just gotten the inside scoop on the Inside Sales Show, hosted by Phil Gerbershack. For more content like this, visit InsideSalesShow.com or to never miss an episode, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Your mileage may vary. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Don't forget to tip your waitress. See you next time.